Amen. Thank you so much, Stephen. And, and I rejoice in hearing what God is doing in the lives of young people. And by the way, if you're here today and your young person, your teenager is not tied in to our youth program, we would encourage you to do that. They have so many external influences that are bombarding their mind and their hearts that it's so important to get them plugged in, not only with a group of other young people that love Jesus, but to get them plugged into a place where they're going to learn God's word, they're going to be encouraged to pursue Jesus with all their heart and soul and mind. And so if they're not, I would encourage you to uh, touch base with Stephen and get them plugged in. Well, it's good to be back. Did you miss us last week? Did you even know we were gone? You might not have even known we were gone. We were on we were on vacation for a couple of weeks, and so it's, uh, it's great to be back. And if you haven't listened to Brad's message last week, if you weren't here, I'd encourage you to get online and listen to that. What a fantastic message about waiting on God. And we appreciate Pastor Brad and his willingness to, uh, to share what God places on his heart. Take your Bibles with me today and turn to John chapter 13. Your Bible, your iPhone, uh, your iPad, whatever you have, we're going to put it up on the screen in just a few moments. Let me encourage you during the summer to do two things. Number one, if you're in town, let me encourage you to be faithful in church. And you're here today, so you're doing that. And so I commend you. And even if you're out of town, let me encourage you to come back. Always on Monday, the message is up online, and you can view the message online, and we would encourage you to do that. But let me encourage you to be faithful in your giving as well. Even while you're away, all the ministries, all of our mission projects, all of that continue through the summer. And so it's important for us to remain faithful in in doing that. And God's, God's at work even during the summer. And uh, God's doing some great things here at Hollywood Community Church. So let me ask you before we dive into the passage, have you ever been given advice that was counterintuitive? By that I mean, have you ever had a, a doctor, uh, a family friend, a lawyer, or someone recommend you something, recommend that you do something that didn't seem to make any sense at all. Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever had anybody that that gave you a recommendation that you sit back and said, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So so as I was thinking about that, I thought about my cardiologist who was always encouraging me to exercise my heart. And, And here's what my cardiologist says. He says, Brian, here's what we want you to do. While you're exercising, We want you to get your heart rate up to about 120 to 140 beats a minute. And I sit back and I listen to him and I go, I think, hello, doesn't this guy know that I've had a couple of heart attacks, I've had open heart surgery, I have three stents. I would think that he would be looking at me saying, Brian, we want you to rest, we want you to relax, we want you to put your feet up in the air, don't do anything to overexert yourself. Wouldn't that seem to make sense? But no, he looks at me and says, Brian, I want you to push your heart. Want me to push your heart. We want you to push your heart. Evidently, stress on the heart actually strengthens it. What the doctor tells me seems to be counterintuitive, but it's actually for my benefit. If you watch the news this week, you heard of several beachgoers who were caught by rip currents. And we're taken far offshore. If you saw the news, you probably saw that on the news this week. When you've, when you've been caught in a rip current, the natural reaction is to try to frantically swim towards shore as strong and as fast as you possibly can. But lifeguards say, don't do that. Lifeguards tell you, if you're ever caught in that situation, to do something that is counterintuitive. It seemingly doesn't make sense. They say swim parallel to the shore for a, for a, for a distance, going away from the location where you are, and eventually you'll come to a place where there's no rip current, and you'll be able to swim back towards shore. Hey, just a swimming lesson this morning if any of you are headed to the beach, all right? But we're constantly given advice and recommendations that seem to be counterintuitive, that seemingly don't make sense. Well, in today's passage, Jesus does something that seems illogical to us. And not only does Jesus do something that, from a human perspective, doesn't make any sense, but he then commands us 
to do the exact same thing that he did. And so if you have your Bibles, John chapter 13, we're going to read the first 15 verses. We'll put the verses up on the screen. Follow along with me today. John says, now, before the feast of Passover, let me just pause there because often people read this passage and they think that this is the Passover meal. But John very clearly says that what takes place here in this passage was before the Passover. As a matter of fact, later in the chapter, verse 28, Jesus tells Judas what you're going to do, do quickly. And the disciples thought that he was sending Judas to buy supplies for the feast of Passover. So this is not the Passover. This is a few days before Jesus was crucified. Now, before the feast of Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. That's a powerful phrase because if you've read through the New Testament, you'll remember that Jesus repeatedly said, my hour hasn't come. My hour hasn't come. My hour hasn't come. But here in John chapter 13, Jesus realizes that his hour had come to depart out of this world. In other words, his arrest, his trial, his, his crucifixion were all imminent. They were about to take place. When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you ought to say amen there because he loves you and me to the end. During supper, When the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. If you have the habit of underlining in your Bible, that would be a great verse to underline, a clear teaching on the sovereignty of God. Verse 4, Jesus rose from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. I want to pause here for a second. We'll finish reading the chapter in just a moment. But I want to, I want to set the scene for what is taking place so that we can fully understand not only what Jesus is doing, but the actions that precipitated what Jesus is doing in the passage. Luke tells us, if you take Luke's gospel and you set it beside John's gospel, Luke tells us that before this supper, that the disciples were arguing among themselves. As a matter of fact, I'll put the verse up on the screen. Luke 22, 24 says this, a dispute rose among them. There was a dispute between the disciples. This argument arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. <laughs> I read that passage of scripture and I, I, I laugh to a certain degree. Here are the disciples evidently in Jesus' presence And they begin to have a discussion as to which of them would be greatest in the kingdom of God. I cannot even begin to imagine how that conversation went. You know, whether whether Peter looked at the rest of them and said, well, I want you to know I'm part of the inner circle here, and so I'm going to have a greater responsibility than you. Or another one of the disciples, John, would say, yeah, but I want you to know that Jesus loves me more than he loves you. The text doesn't tell us how that conversation went, but I can't imagine the gall and the audacity of the disciples in Jesus' presence to begin discussing who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God of God. And so as they arrive at the supper, most Bible scholars tell us that there was a noticeable tension that takes place. And so they arrive at what we refer to as the Last Supper. If you've seen da Vinci's painting of the disciples around the table, they arrive at at what we would refer to as the Last Supper. But there was a tension. Da Vinci doesn't capture it in his painting, but there was a tension that was taking place. No one wanted to assume the role of the servants. No one wanted to wash the other feet or the feet 
of the others. And so they sat there to a certain degree in silence, waiting to see which disciple would admit inferiority. You see, generally in that culture, we don't get it because we don't wash feet. And we ought to say amen right there that we don't have to wash feet. But but we don't wash feet, so we don't understand the cultural implications. But during New Testament times, generally the most humble, the most inferior person in the room would take on the responsibility of washing feet. So humorously, the disciples on the way to this dinner are discussing who was the greatest. And they get there, there's no slave, there's no servant to wash feet, and they sit down cross their arms and wonder who is going to admit inferiority who is going to humble themselves and take the position of a servant when Jesus suddenly rises from the table the text says that he takes off his outer garment how that looked he grabbed a towel probably a towel similar to this he wrapped the towel around his waist he grabbed a pitcher you didn't know they had Tupperware back then did you <laughs> right grabbed a pitcher filled with water he poured it into a basin and one by one he walks over to the disciples who weren't sitting on chairs by the way they were inclined around the table he bent down And he takes the dirty feet of each of those disciples. If you study how it was done, he probably took a pitcher of water and poured it over the feet. And then he took the towel that was wrapped around him and he took those dirty, smelly, stinky feet of the disciples and washed them and dried them. The text doesn't say, but it indicates that there was a holy silence in the room. Nobody says anything. The disciples were probably a little shocked. They probably were somewhat embarrassed. They didn't know what to say as Jesus one by one washed their feet. No one said anything until Jesus came to Peter. (laughs) We don't know what number Peter was, whether he was first or second or last, but Jesus comes to Peter, and in pure Peter, Petrian fashion, notice what Peter says. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord, do do you wash my feet? In other words, here's what he's saying. Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Asking him, as if... He was reticent. He didn't want Jesus to do that. Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand, but now afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. So so here's Peter thinking he's taking the spiritual stand. Jesus had just washed the feet of five, six, seven other disciples. And Peter's like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to allow you to do that. You will never wash my feet. Jesus comes back with an incredibly spiritual answer. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, if I do not wash, you have no share with me. So then Peter's like a pendulum, is he not? So Peter always swings from one extreme to the other. So Peter moves from, okay, Lord, you're never going to wash my feet, to now he's saying, okay, Jesus, wash me all over. All right, wash my head, wash my hands, wash my feet, wash under my arms if you want, wash me all over. Jesus then looks at him, and Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. Jesus makes a tremendous statement as to to the salvation of Peter. Peter, you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. Remember at the table are 12 disciples. One of those 12 disciples at the table is Judas Iscariot. And and we'll make reference to that at the end of the message today. Verse 12, when he had washed their feet and put his outer garments back on, 
and resume his place. Please catch these verses. Jesus said, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. In other words, he said, you recognize my authority, right? You, you recognize the word teacher is the, is the word for rabbi. You, you, you recognize my spiritual authority. You recognize my divine authority. You call me teacher and Lord. And you are right, for that's who I am. If then your Lord and teacher has washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And then he makes the command in verse 15. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. All right, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take off your shoes and socks. No, I'm just teasing. Let's pray together today. Lord, help us to understand your word this morning. Father, I, I believe this is a passage of scripture that most of us are familiar with today. We're familiar with the story, but Lord, the concept of humbling ourselves and serving others is foreign to us. It's easy for us to love those who love us. It's easy for us to serve those who love us. But it's difficult for us to serve the unlovely. It's difficult for us to wash dirty feet. And yet in the passage, that's exactly what you are calling us to do. So Lord, help us to understand more than the story today. Help us to comprehend exactly what it is, the truth that Jesus is conveying and help us to be a church that washes feet. Help us to be a church that responds to others as Jesus responds to us. And we thank you for what you're going to teach us this morning. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I have to admit today that this passage is extremely convicting to me. Maybe more than any other chapter in the book of John. You might sit back and say, Brian, why is that? Well, well, first of all, I have to admit that to me there's nothing more disgusting than dirty feet. <laughs> and, and just the concept that Jesus would want me to do something that is, is disgusting to me is hard for me to wrap my mind and my heart around. And by the way, when we talk about serving Jesus, we always want to serve Jesus on our terms, do we not? We always want to say, okay, I'll serve you as long as the conditions are the way that I want them to be. I'll wash feet as long as the feet aren't too dirty. I'll wash the feet as long as I get to choose whose feet I wash. And we want to set the conditions. And so as I read that, I see Jesus, as I read this passage, I see Jesus setting no conditions. I see Jesus just willingly loving and doing something that, that, that did not correspond to him, something that someone else should have done. And so the whole concept is, is difficult for me. But I got to confess, I struggle with this passage as well because I struggle with pride. You see, I'm one of the disciples around the table. I'm one of the disciples who has a concept of myself, I think of myself probably better, higher than I should. And it's easier for me to expect others to do the dirty work. It's easy for me to expect others to humble themselves, others to wash feet. It's extremely difficult for me. This passage is convicting even more so when you, when you dive into it because, because Jesus really isn't talking about washing feet in this passage. He's really illustrating his pending death. And most theologians say that he is, he is visibly illustrating what he is about to experience 
in the next few days. As he humbles himself, he takes upon himself the form of a servant to the very lowest point and becomes obedient to death, even the death on the cross. And so as I read this, what convicts me, the idea of humbly serving others is not something that comes natural to me. And I would venture to say, if you were honest today, it's not something that comes natural for most of us. Some people have the gift of serving, but there's limits. There's limits to what extent we serve others. And so to understand this truth and and truly apply it in our homes, in our communities, in our jobs, is very difficult for us. Because all of us like to be served. And there's very few of us that enjoy serving others, that enjoy doing the dirty work. So what is it that Jesus is sharing in this passage? What are a few truths that that you and I can pull? I want to mention three or four that, that have spoken to my heart and I trust will speak to your heart today. The first is this, if you're following in your outline, the first is this, God's view of leadership is different than ours. Catch that, church. God's view of leadership is different than mine, and God's view of leadership is different than yours. To us, leadership is glamorous. Why why leaders are authoritative. Leaders are forceful. We we view leaders and we admire them because they seem to be in control of every situation. Who doesn't inspire that? Why? To be your own man, to be your own woman, to not have a boss, to not have someone over you. Who doesn't aspire to that? To have the ability to tell others what to do so that no one has to tell you what to do. When we view leadership, that is what we think of. We think of someone who has a type A personality, who has the ability to command authority, who has the ability to lead. Yet that's not the way that God views leadership. Not not that any of those things are wrong, but, but, but when God views leadership, he doesn't use authoritarian terminology. When God speaks of leadership, he uses servant terminology. As a matter of fact, I would direct your attention to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 is the the parallel passage of what we read in Luke chapter 22, where it talked about the disciples that were disputing who would be the greatest. And here was Jesus' response to those disciples. Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 45, and Jesus called to them, and he said, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. For whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Would you read that verse with me again? Do we have that verse? Let's read that, just the first part of verse 44. Read that with me, because that, that's just so poignant. Read that with me. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Jesus then talked personally. He said, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I read that as, and I thought about that, and as I meditate that, I, here's what I wrote in my notes. Wow, Jesus flips the narrative, does he not? <laughs> here's what he's saying, for God, the way up is not up. For God, the way up is what? Is down. He says that the first will be last, and the last will be first. He says that the great ones are not the ones who are being served. No, the great ones are the ones who do the serving. Catch that, church. That's so very important. In God's eyes, the great ones are the ones who do the serving. And then he makes that great statement saying, even Jesus, who deserved to be served, even Jesus came not to be served but rather to serve and to give his life as a ransom, as a sacrifice for many. So catch this. I didn't put this in your notes, but I want you to catch this today. 
You are more like Jesus when you serve others than when you do anything else. Did you catch that? Let that at least nod. I know it's a little warm in here, all right? Are you with me? All right. You, you are more like Jesus when you serve others than when you do anything else. In our culture, we honor leaders. We honor preachers. We honor the authors. We honor the singers. We honor the people who are up front. But in God's kingdom, he elevates the volunteers. In God's kingdom, he elevates the faithful children's workers who work behind the scenes Sunday after Sunday. Nobody knows what they're doing, but they're there serving Sunday after Sunday. He elevates those who serve widows. They get no recognition for it, but in their heart, they serve widows. He elevates those who give food to the impoverished. He elevates those who transport people in their car because they have no personal means of transportation. He elevates those who care for the physically disabled. He elevates those who love and care for the mentally challenged. He elevates those who love and care for the homeless. So, so, so here, let me ask you, do you want to be like Jesus? I mean, I think that would be the desire of each and every one of us. Do you want to be like Jesus? If you want to be like Jesus, humbly serve others. That's what he's telling us in the passage. He said, I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. So God's view of leadership is completely different than our view of leadership. I want you to catch there's a second truth that kind of resonated in my heart in the passage, and I, I might not explain this a little, but the second truth is this. Humble service is rooted in confidently knowing your position in Christ. Humble service is rooted, it's founded in confidently knowing who you are in Jesus Christ. I go back to a verse that seemed out of place in the passage. I read it as we walk through. Go back to it with me. In verse 3, it said, it was before the Passover. Jesus knew that his hour had come. He was about to die. He was about to leave the world. And then verse 3 makes this statement that seemingly doesn't fit in the passage. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. That is a deeply theological statement. So what in the world is John saying in verse 3? Let me summarize it this way. Here's what it means. Jesus didn't have an inferiority complex. He didn't. Jesus knew exactly who he was. He was confident in his person as the Son of God. He knew from where he had come, and he knew to where he was going. In other words, he didn't have to protect his position. He didn't have to impress others. He wasn't looking for a promotion. He wasn't trying to move up the social ladder. He really didn't care what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and others thought of him. There was only one person that he was trying to, uh, to impress, and that only person was his father. He knew where he had come from, and he knew where he was going. He knew who he was. And because he knew who he was, he could humble himself without losing anything. He could take off his divine garments and he could put on his servant garments and he was still the incarnate son of God. He could wrap a servant's towel around him and he could grab dirty feet, something that only slaves did. And he was still God in human flesh. He knew who he was. And because he knew who he was, he could humble himself to the very lowest position and serve others. So I thought through that. I didn't think of your life. I thought of my life. Often it's our pride that hinders us from humbling ourselves and washing feet. We're worried about what other people think. We're worried about losing status. 
We're worried about losing influence. And we allow our pride to keep us from serving others. We allow our pride to keep us from washing feet. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? Listen, if you know who you are as a child of God, there should be nothing that keeps you from humbling yourself and washing feet. You say, Brian, what does that look like? Let me give you a couple illustrations of how it looks. What if you humbly forgave those who offended you? What if you lovingly gave to those who tried to take advantage of you? What if you served those who abused you? What if you spoke kindly to those who spoke badly of you? What if you loved your enemies? You say, Brian, why would I do that? Why would I love someone who doesn't love me? Why would I speak kindly about somebody who is constantly behind my back, speaking badly of me? Why would I forgive someone who is deeply offended me? Because you want to be like Jesus. And you want to follow Jesus' example. And you don't need to worry about your position. You don't need to worry about your prestige. You don't need to worry about what anyone, not even that person, thinks about you because the only person that you are trying to please is Jesus Christ. And so you desire to act like him. So I I thought through that list, and I asked myself the question, how could you do that? Why would you do that? And catch this, church, that this is deep, all right? When you know your position in Jesus Christ, others can diminish you. Others can devalue you. Others can humble you. It doesn't matter because you know in Jesus Christ you have an elevated position. Did you catch that? Let's be honest. That's why we don't do it. We don't do it because we don't want to feel diminished. We don't do it because we don't want to feel devalued. We don't do it because we don't want to be taken advantage of. We're all about building a fence around ourselves and protecting ourselves. And here's what Jesus is saying In me, man, you are a child of God. You are an heir of God. You are a co heir with Jesus Christ. You are a saint. You are sanctified. You are redeemed. You have a home in heaven. Humble yourself here upon the earth. It doesn't matter because what I have for you in the future is far better than anything you could ever do or receive here upon the earth. You see, humble service is rooted in knowing who we are in Jesus Christ. Your future is secure. Who cares what others think? Humble yourself and wash feet. Humble yourself and wash feet. There's a third thing. Let me mention this quickly because I I, want to get to the last one. The third one is this. Sanctification is the purifying work that Jesus does in you through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. We talk about Jesus' discussion with Peter, the only conversation that takes place in the passage. Jesus comes to wash Peter's feet, and I don't want to rehash it. Peter says, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part with me. And Peter says, then wash me all over. And Jesus says, I don't have to wash you all over because you're already clean. Uh, Jesus is talking about more than washing feet in that conversation. He's not looking at Peter saying, you know what, hey, hey, yeah. You took a bath, you don't stink the rest of you. All you need to have are your feet washed. That's not what he's talking. Jesus is talking in much more deep spiritual terms. He's not talking about physical cleansing at that moment. He's talking about spiritual cleansing. He's talking about the sanctifying work that Jesus does in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. The fact that God's desire for you and me is for us to be spiritually clean. Catch this today, because this is going to be a little bit 
a little bit evangelical, countercultural, okay? So if I step on any toes, I step on some toes today. But God's ultimate goal for you is not success here upon the earth. God's ultimate goal for you is not prosperity. It's not a happy life at this moment. God's ultimate goal for you is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Because, because we've messed it up. We've messed it up. We sit back and think, oh, God wants me to have this, and God wants me to have this, and God wants me to have this. And we have all of those things, and all of those things don't push us towards holiness. Those things don't push us towards righteousness. Those things don't push us towards Christ-likeness. And Jesus looks at you and me and says, here's what I want. I want you to be clean. I want you to be sanctified. I want you to be whole. Listen, you don't have to be completely cleansed because that already happened when you gave your heart and life to me. But I desire to continue to do a cleansing work in your life so that you become more and more and more like me. So let me ask you today, are you becoming more like me? Jesus. Think back to the time when you trusted Christ as your Savior, whether it was a year ago or five years ago or ten years ago or whenever it was. Are you becoming more and more like Jesus Christ? You see, God's goal for you is not just that you come to church on Sunday morning, you sing a few songs, you give some money in the offering plate, you go home and you live your life, and next Sunday, Lord willing, you come back and do the exact same thing. If we're not careful, we fall into that rut and we think as long as I'm doing that, that's what God wants for me. And we're not being changed from the inside out. Here's what God wants. God wants to change you. He wants you to make you a godly husband who loves and cares for your wife and is Jesus to your wife. He desires, you, he, he desires for you to be a wife who responds to your husband like you respond to Jesus Christ and for your life slowly but surely to be changed. He wants you to become a model employee where you work, an employee that demonstrates Christ's likeness in the workplace. He wants you to demonstrate patience and godliness with your family members who get on your nerves, but he wants you to be Jesus to them. Just as he looked at Peter and says, Peter, man, I want to I cleanse you. I want to wash you. That is exactly what God desires for you. He wants to sanctify you. Are you allowing him to do that in your life? 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus one final thing that I see in the passage, and this to me was the most convicting thing. One final thing in this passage that really speaks to me. We didn't read the verses, but at the end of the dinner, Judas is predicted to betray Jesus. You can actually read the verses later. They're verses 21 through 28. So here's what's taking place. So, 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 so they've already eaten dinner. Jesus has gone through that, and, and as they're concluding dinner, Jesus looks at the 12 disciples who are seated around him and says, one of you will betray me. Now, now if, if we were with Jesus and that statement was made, man, we would begin to wonder, who is it? <laughs> First of all, I'd sit back and think, man, I hope it's not me, you know? And then, and then I'd sit back and think, no, 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 it can't be me. It must be, it's got to be, you know, Jose, it's got to be, it's got to be him, you know, for sure. It's got to be, it's got to be somebody else. So, so, so John actually takes the initiative and asks Jesus who the betrayer would be. Jesus then goes further. He says, why, it's the one to whom I'm going to give a piece of bread. And so they're at the table. Jesus actually takes a morsel, a piece of bread, dips it in this cherth sauce and hands it to Judas Iscariot. Judas was such a tremendous actor. Jesus hands it to him, and he basically looks at him and says, what you're going to do, do quickly. The other disciples, amazingly, have no clue what's taking place. They would have never suspected that Judas would be the traitor. 
Judas stands up and walks out, and they're thinking that he's telling Judas, okay, go buy stuff for the feast. But Jesus is indicating who the betrayer would be, and Judas leaves that supper and goes, and the next day or so betrays Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to catch, and this is what spoke to me in the passage. Judas betrayed Jesus, but he betrayed Jesus with clean feet. Judas betrayed Jesus, but he betrayed Jesus with clean feet. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Jesus knew who his betrayer was. It would have been humanly completely understandable to wash Peter's feet and James' feet and John's feet and Bartholomew's feet and one by one watch all the feet and get to Judas and look at him and say, I'm not washing your feet. I know exactly what you're going to do. Why would I humble myself and serve you when you're about to stab me in the back, when you're about to betray me, when you're about to turn me over to authorities. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him, yet he washed his feet anyways. Catch the truth of that. Here's what I wrote in my notes. True leaders are servants. True leaders are servants. Jesus said, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Church, here's the walkaway point today that I want us to catch. The more humbly you serve others, the greater you are in the kingdom of God. Can I say that again? The more humbly you serve others, the greater you are in the kingdom of God. And so I ask you today, who can you serve? As a matter of fact, let me say it this way. Who has dirty feet in your life? Who do you know who has dirty feet? Just imagine today if all of us at Hollywood Community Church left here and said, we're servants. That's who we are. We're servants. We're servants of the Most High God. But we have been called to serve others. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave here today, and I'm going to look for someone who has dirty feet. I'm going to look for someone to whom I can demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ. What would it look like for Hollywood Community Church to wash Maybe it means reaching out to a family member that you haven't gotten along with for a long time and picking up the phone, saying, I love you. I'm sorry. Can we sit down and talk? Maybe it would be reaching out to a single mom who has made bad decision after bad decision after bad decision, and you're frustrated by her bad decisions, and you've wiped your hands of that individual, maybe it would be reaching out to her and loving her and being Jesus to her. Maybe it would be being patient with a friend who, an alcoholic friend who reverts to drinking over and over and over again, somebody that you threw in the towel and gave up on a long time ago. Maybe it's loving an annoying coworker who speaks bad of you in the workplace. Maybe it's loving a neighbor whose house is always a disaster who brings down the property values in your association. Be Jesus. Our theme this year is live generously. Living generously has much more to do with just money. Living generously has much more to do than just financially giving to the work of God. I remind you, in the first Sunday of the year, we looked at Philippians 2, 4, that says, let each of you look not on his own interests, but let each of you look to the interests of others. So what would happen if we left here thinking of other people? What if we left here with the challenge this week of being like Jesus, 
following Jesus' example and looking for an opportunity to rub, or to rub, <laughs> to wash feet. You can rub them too if you want to. Right? <laughs> Where did I get that? Vicky's always saying, would you rub my feet? And maybe it means me going home and rubbing my wife's feet. That may, may, maybe that's what it means. <laughs> maybe that's what I'm going to have to do this afternoon. Listen, we do that because that's exactly the way Jesus treats us. Just a second, Stephen and the team are going to come and we're going to sing this song that talks about how Jesus loves us. And it says this, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies every single day. Aren't you glad that Jesus washes your feet? Aren't you glad that Jesus is patient with you? Aren't you glad that Jesus cares for you? He looks at us and says, I've given you an example. I've washed others' feet. Now I commission you to wash feet. Church, I challenge you as a church family, let's wash feet in our community. You know how we can fill up, and I know it's summer and we have tons of families that are gone. You know how we can fill this auditorium with people that need Jesus? By washing feet. By loving the unlovely, lovely. By caring for those who aggravate us. By being Jesus in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our work, in our schools. If we will follow this command, there's no limit to the ministry opportunities that God will give to us. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Help us to follow the example of Jesus. Help us to do that which doesn't come natural to us, that which is counterintuitive. Help us to wash feet. Help us to realize that the first will be last and the last will be first. The greatest among you will be your slave and your servants. Help us to serve others just as you serve us. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray.